Good morning, everyone. First Sunday of our Advent season, Christmas at City Point, and we begin the Gospel of Matthew. We've been planning this actually for over a year. I talked with the elder team over a year ago, kind of mapped out what we would be doing, and we said we're going to start, we're going to get through the book of Ecclesiastes in the fall of 2019, and then start uh, the book of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew. So we'll be in it during the Advent season, but we're going to continue in it as we uh, get into the new year. So very much looking forward to this. At a recent elder team meeting, we were reviewing that, just talking and praying about it, and when I reminded the team that we would start in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and work all the way through, um, they were, one of them remembered that, the, that Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogical record of Jesus Christ with name after name after name. And he then um, kind of laid his head on the table like this and pretended to snore, and I won't tell you his last name, but his first name is Morris. And so there you go, Morris. That's what you get for doing that. Uh, but so here's the, here's the thing. Uh, now, as people, uh, I know re I recognize that maybe not everybody in the room this morning is a follower of Jesus Christ. I get that. And we're really glad that you're here. Um, but, as, but people who, as followers of Christ, we believe that the Bible is the word of God. And the, and the Bible says that all scripture all Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, all Scripture is inspired by God or breathed out by God and is useful or profitable for teaching and correcting and training in righteousness. So no part of it should be skipped. So it would be crazy for us. We, we, would miss, uh, we would miss something of great value if we just went, oh, that's just all those names. Let's move on. So we're not going to do that. We're actually going to preach the Bible like it was intended to be taught through verse by verse, line by line, okay? But let me start with this, because um, when Matthew wrote his gospel, uh, they did not know, the world was unaware that God had actually, from the very, very foundational kind of parts of a human being, that there's this thing called DNA. That wasn't even discovered. That wasn't known. This is a modern scientific phenomenon, right? This is this amazing, astounding um, uh, discovery, DNA, and they're using it all the time now. You read, it seems like every week we're hearing some sort of a new story about a cold case that was, that was um, solved recently. USA Today just post, uh, published a, an article recently where there was a, a cold case uh, that was 30 years old, unsolved, and, and they found DNA on a yellow sock that had been left behind. They solved the case. 30 years old, DNA left on a 30-year-old yellow sock. And you think, wow, that's amazing. Or I uh, saw recently ABC News, one of their own correspondents um, found a family member that nobody knew existed. So he did a DNA test through 23andMe, and, um, and lo and behold, they found uh, it was his uncle, but his dad's brother, his dad did not know that he had a brother, and now this big family reunion, and it's all cool and pretty awesome, right? You think, wow, that's only through DNA. And uh, actually, Jesse, um, about a year and a half ago for Father's Day, got me a DNA test because I'm in interested in these things. And I know some of my story through my mom, my mom's side, and some of my story through my dad's side, but I, I had never taken a DNA test, so I did. And it was really kind of interesting, and it gave me my ethnicity and all that. And I knew that I was mostly European. Nobody would wonder about that. But what I didn't know, this was kind of a funny thing, I found out that I'm 6.7% South Asian. And when I look in the mirror, I don't see Indian, uh, I don't see India, that's right, the 6.7 is India, uh, it's Punjabi, Sri Lanka, Bengali, 6.7%. And I think, man, no wonder I like that curry and naan bread so much. <laughs> it's right in my bones, right? It's my DNA. I love that stuff. It's so great. Uh, but... They didn't have that when, when Matthew was writing his gospel, and so they would keep these genealogical records, and, so, and they were meticulous about it, making sure that people and people groups could trace their heritage. They could find where they came from and what they're all about, and this is a very important thing. And so gospel, uh, Matthew's gospel starts out with, the, with this genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, we learned a couple of weeks ago, as we kind of set up for Matthew's uh, gospel here, who Matthew is, also known as Levi. He was one of the, one of the original 12 
disciples of Christ, chosen by Jesus uh, to walk with him, to learn, to follow him, all of that. And so Matthew's an eyewitness to the, to the life and the teachings and the miracles and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Matthew's an eyewitness to that. And his gospel, they say, is, was uh, recorded late 50s, early 60s. So that's probably, you know, that's like first generation for sure, uh, within a generation of Jesus actually being on earth. And so it was like for these early Christians, the, the verbal traditions of what Jesus had said and what Jesus had done began to get documented. And then it became really imperative as that first generation was, um, was going to was going to pass away, that they get these things truly documented. And so Matthew writes down the, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ during a time when all of the, you know, most of the people who actually saw and heard what Jesus did could validate and verify these things. And so Matthew's gospel comes together in this way. And again, in the opening of his gospel with this genealogy, he's providing us with this record, really a meticulous record of who Jesus is and where he came from. And it's important for us. It's not just like, oh, all those names and let's move on. And so we begin the Advent season with the, the, the story of Jesus, where he came from, who he was, and what it all means as we celebrate his arrival as a babe in the manger, okay? And so we'll understand the richness and the wonder of this as we, as we read it. So first 17 verses, and it's, there's, if you know some of the Old Testament stories, when you hear these names, you'll recall those stories, which is part of the reason why the, the record is there. Um, but don't get lost in name after name after name. Just take it all in, and of course, we're, we're just going to read it, right? We're going to read it, and then we're going to explain it, and then we're going to read it, and then we're going to explain it, and then we're going to read it, and then we're going to explain it, and then we're going to have lunch, okay? So, so it is intriguing, and, but let me give you my, my three points here, because this is all about Jesus' story. Okay, and, um, and so my three points are this, and you, maybe we'll be able to follow them as we go through, but, but Jesus' story is, is first one of covenantal faithfulness, and I'll explain what that means in just a bit, but it's one of covenantal faithfulness. His story is one of categorical inclusion, pretty homiletical this morning, huh? Covenantal faithfulness, categorical inclusion, and the last point would be chronological precision. Covenantal faithfulness, categorical inclusion, and chronological precision. So let's read the text. It'll just take a few moments, but take it in. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim. And Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliud. And Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask now that you will teach us by your Holy Spirit to not only appreciate it, but to take it in, to learn, to grow. I pray that you would spark faith in our hearts 
And I pray even for those who are with us this morning who are not yet followers of Christ, that you would capture their attention and show them your great love and their great Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, so you, you get there's, there's some real structure to this, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But he goes through, and he's divided up in three segments, Abraham to David, David to the deportation to Babylon, the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations in each segment. So he's written this in this way, very, you know, I, I said in the first gathering that these, these sometimes I think we, we have this idea that, that the people that were writing the scriptures were just, they, they were, um, you know, just kind of happenstance, kind of drafting these things and writing these things down almost randomly like it's some sort of a journal. But it's not the case whatsoever. These guys were, um, they, they were, of course, anointed of the Holy Spirit to do this. They're being, they're being impressed by God to write these things down. But, th- but these guys are intelligent. These guys are very purposeful about their writings. And, and we're going to see that, that in Matthew's gospel. This is well-structured, well-put-together, very intelligent writing. And the first thing that he tells us, let's go back to verse 1. The first thing that he tells us is that Jesus' story is one of covenantal faithfulness. He says, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so when we talk about covenantal faithfulness, we have to understand what a covenant is. Now, if it's between just two people or people groups, it's like an agreement. It's like a contract that was binding. And they were the, the parties that were in this covenant were, were to keep their word and follow through with what they had agreed to. But when God makes a covenant, it's, it's much weightier. It's much more, it's much more uh, significant and solemn. It, it's like God is making a solemn promise and he's putting his own name, if you will, on the line, that he will come through with what he's promised to do. So a covenant from God is God inviting people into relationship with him, and he's doing so for very specific reasons, and we'll see that as we get through this. And the two covenants that Matthew draws attention to were two of the most significant covenants in, the, in all of the Old Testament. The covenant that God made with Abraham, that's recorded beginning in Genesis 12 and reiterated throughout the rest of the story of Abraham's life and his children, and then the, the then the story that was that or the covenant that was that was made uh, by God with David, and so we've got these very significant covenants. And Matthew begins this gospel by telling us that Jesus' story is one of God keeping His solemn promises. Okay? This, is, this is not just the story of, an, of somebody that was a great teacher or a great prophet or somebody who was used by God. This is a story of somebody who has been, this is the story of, of Jesus who is God's answer. He is God's solemn promise keeper. Okay? So this is, this is where we're at. And these covenants are Abraham and David. But he begins this line with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This word genealogy is the Greek term for Genesis. So if you know your Old Testament, you know the very first book in the Bible is the book of Genesis. And it means the book of beginnings. So, so when, when Matthew writes the book of the genealogy, he, we're translating this genealogy because of the, the, the list of all of the names that give us that record. But that word is the Greek word for Genesis. And it's as if Matthew is trying to get his audience, who he wrote his initial audience, it's a universal gospel for all people, but his initial audience is the Jewish people. So he begins right off the bat trying to get his audience to hearken back to the first book in, the, in, their, in their scriptures, the book of Genesis. And he's trying to tell them that, and he's getting them to think back to Genesis and go, okay, this is the book of the book of beginnings where God created and God made everything good. And by the time we get to chapter 3, we see that mankind has fallen from grace. They've fallen from the ways of God. They have sinned and wrecked a perfect world. And this world is now broken. And the rest of the story of the Old Testament is God putting together this redemptive plan. And when we get to this first book in the New Testament, Matthew says this is a book of Genesis. This is a book of beginnings. In other words, he's saying what happened back then was the beginning, and what I'm telling you now is that Jesus, with the coming of Jesus, we get a new beginning. 
with the coming of Christ, there's a new start. God is bringing about, he's keeping his covenant promises, and he's bringing about a new beginning, a new start for us. This is the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the new beginnings, right? So Jesus, this is the name that was given to him, told by God, the, the, uh, Mary and Joseph told by God to name him Jesus, and we'll get to that next week. But this word Jesus, this name, it's the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. And it's a common name, uh, but, it, but it means the Lord saves. And in the New Testament, or I'm sorry, in the Old Testament, when you see the Lord, all capitalized, L-O-R-D, that's, that is the personal name of God. It's not a title, it's the personal name of God. It's Yahweh. Okay, the Hebrew name, God's personal Hebrew name, Yahweh. And so Jesus means Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. So, so he says, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus, of God's salvation, Christ. Christ is not his last name. Some, some people would, it's just common to think that. Why would you, you would think that, right? But Christ is a title. So, so Christ, again, Greek term, Christ means the anointed one. The Jews understood it as Messiah, the Savior, the one that God had promised. Again, we hearken back to the book of Genesis, and right in the third chapter where the fall was recorded, we also get that first, what's known as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel declaration where God says, I'm going to fix this. <laughs> you guys have wrecked it, but I'm going to fix it. There's one coming, this Messiah, who will bring things back to the way I intended them to be, okay? And so when Jesus is called the Christ, they're saying he is the promised Messiah, this one person who would fulfill the triad role that Messiah was given, prophet, priest, and king. All three of those are critical to who, who Jesus is and the work that he did. So when, when, when Matthew says this is the book of the genealogy, the b new beginnings of this of God's salvation, Jesus, who is the Christ, he is the anointed one. That's what Christ means, the anointed one. And he's anointed as the prophet. He's anointed, uh, as a prophet, he's anointed to, to tell us the truth. To tell us the truth about God and about ourselves. And we certainly see Jesus did that. Right? He's anointed as the priest, the one who would bring the perfect and necessary sacrifice. And he's anointed as king, the one who is anointed to conquer our great enemies, namely sin and death. So this is Jesus the Christ, right? And the entire gospel of Matthew is evidence that Jesus is the Christ. So, so again, we look at the, it says, the book of the genealogy. It's not just the record. It's not just all of the names. Matthew's trying to tell us all 28 chapters, as we know them, all 28 chapters, those, all of those show us who Jesus is. That he is God's salvation. He's the anointed one, right? So this is how he begins his book. And then he says he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of David meaning that Ma Matthew informs us that, that Jesus would be in the kingly line, the offspring of David, which will make sense in just a moment, but that... It could, Jesus could trace his lineage back to Israel's greatest king, David. And, um, but that's not the most important part. See, D Jesus was one of, the, he was a legal heir to the Davidic throne. You could trace his bloodline. Now, of course, he's not the only one. There's others that could trace their bloodline back to David. So he's one of the possible legal heirs to the Davidic throne. But again, that's not the most important part. See, God made that covenant with David, that solemn promise that the Messiah would come through his family line through, and it would be, and he would establish an eternal kingdom. So we read that in 2 Samuel 7, and this is what it says. God is speaking to David, and he says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, meaning you die, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, right there, if we pause right there at verse 12, we could go, oh, that, he's probably just talking about Solomon. Well, Solomon was the immediate fulfillment of that, but Solomon couldn't be the full and the entire fulfillment of that, because verse 13 says, he will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So we know Solomon was a human being, and he died. 
right? So it can't, be, it can't just be Solomon. God has made this covenant that there would be this eternal kingdom. So Matthew presents Jesus as the fulfillment of God's solemn promise that was established, that, that God would establish this eternal kingdom. Now, if we, we put the kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the, there's other gospels that give account to this as well. So when I'm trying to find the word, I, I couldn't find it in my head. Maybe you could find it. Um, sorry about that. Um, the, 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 the agreement is what I'm trying to get to, I guess. The agreement of other gospels that point to Jesus being the fulfillment of this. So Luke says it like this. So Luke records this conversation that Mary has with an angel. And the angel says here, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. So there's a divine element to that, right? We know that. He will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. There's the human element. So you've got divine and human in one person. He's the God-man, right? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his, of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is what Matthew's telling us is, right off the bat, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, and it was a covenant of this. It's an eternal kingdom, that, the, that Messiah would be God, a God-man person that he would be divine and human, and he would come and fulfill that triad role of prophet, priest, and king, the anointed one. So this is the Davidic covenant that God had made all those years prior to Christ, about a thousand years prior to Christ. And then Matthew also gives us the record that he is the son of Abraham. So he could trace his lineage not just to David, but all the way back another thousand years to Abraham. And we go, okay, who was Abraham? Well, Abraham was a Chaldean. He was from Ur in Mesopotamia, which on our modern maps would be on the border between Iraq and Kuwait, kind of on the northwest tip of the Persian Gulf, okay? And so Abraham, this was a very pagan society, pagan meaning they worshipped idols and they worshipped the earth. That's what they did. They did not recognize the one true God. So Abraham grew up in a society that was very pagan. His own home that he grew up in was very pagan, and Abraham himself was a pagan, but God called him to leave and to start an entirely new race of people. And that, again, that's not the most important part. It's the covenant that God made with Abraham that makes, makes the, the difference here. So Abraham has been given this solemn promise by God that through his offspring, God was going to bless all the nations. So we've got to put this together. Think about this. So prior to Abraham, there was no such thing as Jewish people. Every race of people started somewhere, and the Jewish people started with Abraham. From his line come the entire lineage of the Jewish race. And, the, and what the Bible tells us is that the Jewish people were established as a people, starting with Abraham, so that God could bless all people. He he created this people so that he could bless all people. We read this in the book of Genesis, chapter 12. And it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make, you, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him whom dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a promise that God reiterated to Abraham throughout the rest of his life and passed on to his children that through the seed of Abraham, God was going to bless all of the nations. From this one nation would come the, the, the Messiah who would bless all nations, right? So Matthew presents Jesus as the fulfillment of this. And he, that that. God is going to bless all of the nations through Abraham's offspring, the Lord Jesus. And the apostle agrees with this, the apostle Paul. And this is what he said. And this is kind of interesting. Galatians chapter 3, it says, and the scripture, and he's referring to the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So let's think about this for just a moment. So what the apostle Paul is saying is that the, in the Old Testament, when, when God said to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, when God said to Abraham, in you shall all the nations be blessed, the apostle Paul is saying 
that God actually declared the gospel to the nations when he made that statement to Abraham. The scripture for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Now remember, to, to justify is it's a legal term. It's to declare somebody innocent who isn't innocent, but you declare legally that they are innocent. So this is a, this is a gospel declaration. This is God saying to the world through Abraham that there's this one who's going to come who's going to pay the price for your, for your sins, for your faults, for your mistakes, for your errors, for your waywardness. And he's going to take all of it upon himself and he's going to die your death because the wages of sin is death. And then he's going to conquer death by coming back to life. And if you will trust him that he did that on your behalf and that your faults and your sins are included in that, you'll be justified because the price has been paid. And God, foreseeing that he would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. He's saying that that statement where God says, in you shall all the nations be blessed, is a, do- a gospel declaration. He's t- declaring the good news of Jesus Christ. Interesting, huh? So Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant as well, a covenant that promised a worldwide family, the family of God. So we put these together. Matthew points out the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant said there's going to be an eternal kingdom, that human beings are not simply um, mortal. We're more than mortal, right? We will exist forever. And God is building a global family, a worldwide family of people who will live in that eternal kingdom. And it's those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's this, we talk about our, the language that we use here in, in, in City Point Church is, is, that, is that, uh, that, that our our vision is to grow the family of God. But we know that we don't grow the family. God grows his family. Our job is to live the gospel with those inside the family, to bring the gospel to those outside the family so that those who are outside could come in. And the whole story of Jesus is one of covenantal faithfulness where God is bringing people from the outside in. This is Matthew's story. He was brought from the outside in. In fact, that's every single person's story who's ever come in, they came in from outside. They came in from outside of that that, that family. And God is building this eternal family for his eternal kingdom. And this this is where Matthew begins his story. So it's the first thing we find is that God is keeping his solemn promises. This is a story of covenantal faithfulness. Now, the second thing as we get into the actual genealogical record is that of categorical inclusion. And I know that some of you are nervous right now, thinking there are 46 people in this list. How are we going to do this? Well, we're not. We're not going to do it entirely, right? But he goes from Abraham all the way to Christ in this successive symmetrical ways. And it's, it's tempting for us because the story, the, the story of the Jewish people uh, are, is all right here. There's just such beauty and power in all of this story, but we, we, don't, we, we, we really don't have the ability, the time to go through that this morning. But here's what I want you to see in this. We got to, rather than a micro view, I want us to take a macro view of what we've already read. And the first thing that we see is that the world is included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, of course, There are lots of Jews in the lineage of Jesus Christ, as we would expect since God started the Jewish people with Abraham for the sake of bringing Messiah. But it's not exclusively Jewish. The world is represented. Now, we talk about categorical inclusion. In the Bible, there are two categories, Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's all of the nations. Right? So it's just two broad categories, Jews and Gentiles. And we see that there are Gentiles in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So all, the whole world is represented here. First, I mean, we start with Abraham, right? Abraham wasn't a Jew until he became one. Truly, he is the non-Israelite father of Israel. So he started out as a Gentile, and then God called him out, and he became a Jew. And that's where all that started. But then we see Tamar. And Rahab, they were Canaanites. You see Ruth, she was from Moab, right? So we see both categories, Jews and Gentiles represented here. Another thing that we we should notice here is that both genders are included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Matthew does something that is 
uh, not necessarily normal here. It's out of the ordinary to include women in a genealogical record. That wasn't something that was all that common. But he does so purposefully. And so when we count Mary, which of course we would want to count Mary, when we count Mary, there are five women listed in the genealogical record of Jesus Christ. And it's like he's showing us that both men and women, both genders, are included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. We got Jews and Gentiles. We got men and women who are included in. It's like he's trying to tell us this is Jesus' story and men and women are both important. They both, both play key roles in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So it's categorical inclusion. All nations, Jews and Gentiles, all people, men and women. And then we get to this third point that we can't miss, and that is that there are no perfect people in the lineage of Jesus Christ. We want to be careful here, right? There are no perfect people. So we got Jesus' story is one of categorical, categorical inclusion, right? So we first see that the world is seen in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Second, we see that both genders are included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And third, we see that no perfect people are included. Let's start with Abraham. Now, we're not going to go through all 46 names, but let's start with Abraham. Who's Abraham? Well, remember, he started out as a pagan. He's worshiping the earth, and he's worshiping false gods. He said, well, what, after, what about after God called him? Yep, he was a man of faith. He had a habit of lying <laughs> when he was younger, but he's not perfect. He was a man of faith for sure, and he was, James calls him a friend of God, which is pretty remarkable, but, but he was not perfect. And then we get Isaac. Isaac's the promised son for sure. Isaac's the promised son, and yet he's not a very good father. At least by biblical record, he's not a very good father. And then, of course, we get Jake, Jacob, who's a deceiver. He, he's a deceiver, kind of a bit of a tricky thief, until God literally got a hold of him. And then Judah? What about Judah? Well, Ju Judah, oh man, we've got to think high, highly of him, except for he's the one, if you remember, he's the one that suggested to the rest of the brothers that they take their brother Joseph and sell him into slavery in Egypt. <laughs> You're like, whoops, strike three for Judah. And then Tamar? She's next in the line. Who's Tamar? Well, Tamar, Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law, and she disguised herself as a prostitute, had a sexual incestuous sexual relationship with her father-in-law, and that's where the twins, Perez and, Ter and Zerah, come from in verse 3. You're like, ooh, this is getting kind of sorted. This is kind of a tough one, right? And then there's Rahab. Rahab didn't disguise herself as a prostitute. She was a prostitute. <laughs> You're like, okay, this is not the greatest pedigree in the whole wide world. David, oh, come on, David. Now we get to David, of course. David... Israel's greatest king, man after God's own heart, wrote whole huge, huge parts of the Psalter. I mean, a great warrior for God. Oops, that's that. There's that, 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 that part about him committing adultery and then murdering, having somebody killed. I mean, you go to prison for that sort of stuff, right? David, of course, Bathsheba. You got problems. He, she's probably a Jewish woman who, who enters into an illegal marriage with a Hittite and then commits adultery against that Hittite with David. You're like, whoa, this is twisted up, isn't it? Get this whole list of kings that toggles back and forth between decent kings and terrible kings, wicked kings, but even the decent ones, the Bible gives us the fact, gives us, tells us the truth that they're, like they had their issues. Even the decent ones had their issues. The whole deportation to, to, is, uh, deportation to Babylon was because of Israel's enduring rebellion and stubbornness against God. Kent Hughes is a pastor and scholar. He gets to the end of this in his commentary and he says, and you thought your family tree was a mess, <laughs> right? See, see, I think what we have here is Matthew not just giving us the legal record of who Jesus' family is. We're, we're meant to see these as human beings, as no perfect people, we're not given this list to stand in awe of the amazing pedigree of Jesus Christ. We're given this list to come to terms with our own sinfulness 
by way of seeing that Jesus' own family needed a savior. <laughs> right? His own family needed a savior. There's nobody exempt from this. The whole world, Jews and Gentiles, need a savior. The whole world, men and women, need a savior because there are no perfect people. Not even in the lineage of Jesus Christ. They're all fallen. They all need a savior. And Jesus is that savior. It's categorical inclusion. It's what we see. We see Jews and Gentiles. We see men and women. We see royalty and common folk. We see heroes and harlots, faithful and faithless, and yet ultimately all sinners, all in need of grace, all in need of a Savior. And it's all part of the story. It's Jesus' story, categorical inclusion. And then we get to this last verse, and I love this last verse, where we see Jesus' story is one of chronological precision. So look again at verse 17. So all the generations... From Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the, de to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So, so God is, God, first we see God is telling Jesus' story with artistry. There's, there's such a, there's a beauty and a purposefulness to this. The structure of it, the, the symmetry of it is very purposeful. From Abraham to David. 14 generations. From David to the deportation, 14 generations. From the deportation to the Christ, 14 generations. We see this symmetry here. We see it. It's, it's, it's like he's, he's giving us these details, but he's doing it in such a way that we could, we could see some intelligence to it all. Okay? The, first thing, the first thing that we, that we recognize in this is that this is what is known as telescoping. Okay? So those who kept a record would often put, put their record together in such a way that it could be memorized easily and that it, that it had some poetic expression to it. And that's what we see with Matthew. So the telescoping is this. Where in places in this genealogical record, the father, this guy is the father of this guy. But when we look back in the Old Testament, this guy, this guy is the father of this guy. It's just that he's the great, great, great grandfather of this guy. So he's compressed history, and we can go back and, and look up the record and see it in its entirety. But Matthew's putting it together here to show that Jesus is in the lineage of David and Abraham, but he's compressing it in this symmetrical way so that we could appreciate it and so that it could be memorized. Right? That was a very much a part of Jewish culture, as you could, if you remember back from a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about that. So it's, it's an intelligent artistry type of writing inspired by the Holy Spirit. The other thing that we see taking place here in God telling Jesus' story with artistry is what's called gematria. And gematria is really a thing, and, uh, but I would just, some people make more of it than they ought to. And I'll explain it to you in just a moment. But this can be carried too far and our kind of little bit of a twisted curiosity sometimes can make more of something than it ought to. And, and, um, and we're not meant to use this kind of artistic expression to try to find some sort of hidden meaning in the Bible. God is not hiding meaning in the Bible that if we could just figure out the equation, some sort of a complex math equation that we could, oh, now we get it. No, the, the meaning of the scriptures is, is plain. God is not hiding it from us. But gematria was something that these authors would use. Gematria is this. Here's what it is. It, it, in the Hebrew alphabet, each letter in, the, in their alphabet was given a numerical value based, based on its placement in the alphabet. So Aleph is the first letter in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. So it's given the value of one. Dalet is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's given the value of four. Vav is the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's given the value of six. So David is Dalet, Vav, Dalet. And you math wizards just went four plus six plus four equals 14. You go, what? David did that on purpose, didn't he? I mean, Matthew did that on purpose, didn't he? 14 generations from Abraham to David. 14 generations from David to the deportation. 14 generations from the deportation to the Christ. He's trying to tell us in a beautiful, artistic way 
that Jesus is the son of David, the promised Messiah, right? This is what we see here. So it's artistry. And the other thing that we see here is that God is telling Jesus' story with perfection, with perfection. Jesus was born into the world with God's perfect actions and in God's perfect timing. In giving us these opening 17 verses, Matthew is telling us that God knows what he's doing. That God has, from the very beginning, been orchestrating all of human history for this moment. That the Son of God would be born into this world. That nothing is random, nothing is happenstance. That God has been telling Jesus' story with perfection. From the very beginning, perfect timing, perfect actions. Now, you and I couldn't do enough mental gymnastics to figure all that out. But this is what Matthew is telling us, that we might know it by faith. Okay? Two verses from elsewhere in the New Testament, Galatians 4 and Romans 5. Galatians 4 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. In the fullness of time, when God had orchestrated everything to be just the way it was meant to be, Christ came into this world born of a woman. Why? Ultimately, so that you and I could receive adoption into that eternal family that God had promised through the Davidic in the Abrahamic covenants, right? The next verse, Romans 5, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's that inside-out thing, or I should say outside-in thing. We're all outsiders, and God is wanting us to come in, and in the right time, at just the right time, Christ came into the world for the ungodly, right? So we have this beautiful language, the fullness of time, at the right time, God's actions are never random, friends. God is at work always. You and I cannot, we cannot trace out his steps. That's an impossibility. But he is purposeful. His timing is never off. He is perfect. And he has planned all of human history around the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' coming is the most important event in human history. He is the most important person in the universe. His coming, the most momentous event. His teachings, the most meaningful things ever said. His death and resurrection, the most significant event in human history. They call this the most wonderful time of the year. And it's the most wonderful time of the year because it's the time of the year when we tell the most wonderful story. It's the story of Jesus. And his story is one of covenantal faithfulness. God keeping his solemn vows, his solemn promises of, of categorical inclusion that we're all part of this and of chronological precision that God is doing it at just the right time. And that brings us to our big idea and that's this. Jesus' story is your story too. Jesus' story is your story too. There's, there's not one of us that could trace our lineage back to the person of Jesus Christ. We do not share his DNA. We're not in the genealogical record. But every one of us is part of God's covenant promises. Every one of us. It's hard to think, it's hard to think uh, that when God was having this conversation with Abraham, recorded back in Genesis 12, these several thousand years ago, it's hard to think that while he's communicating with Abraham, that you and I were in his mind. But we were. You and I were in the mind of God when God was making that promise to Abraham. Fast forward a thousand years, God's having a conversation with David that he's been orchestrating all along the way and while he's having the conversation with David, you and I are in his mind. Hard to believe, right? Most of us don't think of ourselves as being quite that significant. But in the heart and the mind of God, we are. Jesus' story is our story too. You and I are part of the human categories. Whether Jew or Gentile, whether male or female, all of us are part of that categorical inclusion. 
All of us. And you and I are part of God's precision. God has been working in our lives. Sometimes we can tell, and other times we simply cannot tell. But God is never idle, and God is never absent. He's always at work in our lives. Jesus' story is our story too. So Matthew writes this gospel, and we can tell right off the bat that this is not just somebody chronicling some thoughts and some things and, you know, just trying to keep a quick record of, this is really well written. And he writes it for evangelistic purposes. Matthew writes this gospel not so that people could know who Jesus was. Matthew writes this gospel so that people could know Jesus. He wants, he wants us to know Jesus, to know him. Not just to know about him, not just to have some sort of a knowledge of him, that he, who he was, but that we would actually know him personally as our own Savior, as our Lord. This is why Matthew writes this gospel. His intent is to reach people for Jesus. Remember who Matthew was. He was the guy who was on the outside who by the grace of God was brought to the inside. And he looks from the inside out and he's like, I want all these people to know Jesus too. And that's the heart of, that's the heart of God, that we would all know him. Let's bow in prayer. So as we start this Advent season, this Christmas season, we start with this kind of interesting text this genealogical record. Let us see that it is really a story of God's amazing love and His power and His, His work in this world that reaches all the way to us, that God takes outsiders and brings them in. So the first thing I would just encourage you toward is if, if you are... If you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Christ, please know that God loves you. And He would to bring you into His family. And that happens when you confess and believe. That you confess to God that you have not kept His ways. And you believe that Jesus paid the price for your fallenness. Put your trust in Jesus. And be brought into his eternal family. For those of you that have been brought into his family. Remember Jesus' story is not a, it's not a story of his amazing pedigree. All of his family needed a savior. And we could look at our own lives and think. Thank God that he would welcome a sordid character like me. Rejoice in God that he loves you. May the. May the wonder of Christmas for you not be simply the giving and receiving of gifts or the special music or treats or anything of that nature. May you truly love God more because He has given His Son to be your Savior. And I would ask who, who to, to just challenge you. Maybe there's somebody this Christmas season that you could target, that you could be prayerful about and be intentional about reaching out to and helping them to see the love of God. And helping them to see that Jesus' story is their story too. So who could that be? Who would that be? Be prayerful about that. And lastly, I would say, just by way of encouragement, that if, if God can arrange all of history this, with this precision, you can trust Him for the moments that you're in right now. That he's not absent and he's not idle. If God can arrange all of the moments of history, he can, he can manage the moments that you're in right now. So let your heart be at rest. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for Jesus' story that you have given this to us. Help us to believe it. Help us to believe, Lord, that we are part 
of Jesus' story. That the covenants, that the categories, that the chronology, all of it, Lord, you've had us in your mind. You've shown us your love. You've been purposeful about bringing us your great salvation. Help us to trust you. Thank you for your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.